Hello everyone and welcome back to Algebra 1 with Miss Betsy. Today we're going to be talking about how we evaluate algebraic expressions. As my text, I'll be using Algebra 1 for Christian Schools, published by Bob Jones University Press, the second edition. This is what your cover looks like. If you have that book, we are on page 96 today in section 3.4. If you have a different, different edition, it's not going to track the same. You can still learn from it, however. So, oh, thought I was going to catch that pencil, but I didn't. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we welcome your presence with us today. I thank you that you are a real and personal God. I ask that you would help us to comprehend this material that we study today. I ask that you'd help me to explain it clearly and for the kids on the other side of the computer screen to be able to comprehend the material. I thank you that you love us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, I've got several new lame jokes. The first one that we're going to, actually this one isn't real new, but I don't think I've told it to y'all before. What happened to the cat who swallowed a ball of wool? You know, you think of them coughing up a hairball. This time she swallowed a ball of wool. Well, she had mittens as a result of having all of that wool inside her. She had mittens rather than kittens. So yes, I know that is lame. We are going to be talking about what it means to evaluate algebraic expressions. We've already done a lot of that and simply put, we have the definition of the noun value, and it says what is a mathematical definition of value. It says that value is an assigned or calculated numerical quantity. So what we do when we evaluate something is we simply determine what that quantity is. For example, if we wanted to find the value of x plus 10 when x was 5, this is what we're going to do. If I can get that cap off, which two hands works out better than one, we have an algebraic expression x plus 10. It's not an equation because there's not an equal sign. And we want to know what the value of this is, or we're being told to evaluate it. Simply put, as it's written right there, you cannot evaluate it because to evaluate, you have to have a number that you're going to stick in here for the x. So they're going to say evaluate for x plus 10 when x is equal to Five. And this is when we say, okay, now I can come up with a value for this expression here because I know that that x right there is worth 5. So we're going to substitute. It means we take this assigned value for x and we replace x with the 5. So we have 5 plus 10. And the value for that expression becomes 15. And you see, you write the problem and you show your steps line upon line, one line after another after another. Now, is this expression x plus 10 always going to have a value of 15? Well, no. It's going to depend on what x is. So they may say, well, what happens if x is equal to 20? Well, when x is equal to 20, Rather than substitute a value of 5 in here, we're going to replace the x with 20. We have 20 plus 10, which of course now gives us a value of 30 for that entire expression. And this is all they mean when they talk about evaluating algebraic expressions. It means that you're going to have something here that has some letters in it. And you're going to have something off to the side and to the top that tells you what number you're going to use in place of that letter. And then you're going to perform whatever mathematical computations, mathematical operations it tells you to perform. For example, we're going to have example one here in our text that is found on page 96, and it says evaluate, so I'm just going to put evaluate x squared when x 
is equal to 3. If we didn't have this, the remaining stuff right here to the right, if all we had was evaluate x squared, there's absolutely nothing you can do because you don't know what x could be. This could be anything. If x was 1, it would be 1. If x was 10, it would be 100. If x was negative 2, it would be a positive 4. You can only evaluate an algebraic expression when you're given a value for that variable. And I apologize for the noise in the background. I'm actually having my kids do some weed eating in there actually right where I'm recording, but I'm delighted to have the weed eating done. So, we've written the problem. Now we are going to substitute that 3. And even though your book doesn't always tell you this, it's an excellent, good practice to become accustomed to. When you substitute, enclose that number or that expression that you're substituting in parentheses. It just makes it a lot clearer what you're doing. Because here, we now have 3 squared. 3 times 3 is 9 for a value of 9. And I've used this, this illustration over and over, but I'm going to do it again here because this is the perfect example of why we want to use parentheses to help us when we substitute. Let's say that x, rather than having a value of 3, has been given a value of a negative 5. We're going to do this two different ways. First, we're going to do what I say. Substitute in the negative 5 in place of the x and use the parentheses. So we have x squared. I mean, sorry, negative 5, the quantity squared. What does this mean? This 2 says use negative 5 as a factor twice. Negative 5 times a negative 5 is a positive 25. Okay? Pretty clear. Now, I wouldn't expect you don't have to write this step out here. But I'm just illustrating to you what we're doing. Now, however, we have, let's say that we have someone that says, I really, really don't need to put that in parentheses. That's just a waste of time. My teacher doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, we now have a totally different problem. You think that you have substituted in negative 5 for that x, but you haven't. Because what this now says is that we're using just the 5 as a factor twice. So we're taking the opposite of 5 used as a factor two times, which is a negative 25. Negative 5, that whole quantity, squared is a positive 25. The opposite of 5 squared is a negative 25. Both of these problems that I've illustrated for you here, they are both solved correctly. Where the error comes in is in what you're being asked to do. It is true that the opposite of 5 squared is negative 25, but that's not what you were doing. That's wrong because your problem said evaluate x squared when x is a negative 5. So you went off and created your own problem here. This is a perfect illustration of why I say get in the habit of when you substitute, enclosing whatever values you're substituting in parentheses. It just makes it much more clear for you what, you're, what you are actually doing. So let's continue on and see what we have next. Example two. This should be a very, very straightforward section for you guys. You've been working on this. This is a continues to simply be a review of pre-algebra. That cap sticks on really well. We now have evaluate, evaluate x plus y plus z squared when x is 4, y is 9, and z is 2. Okay? 
x, y, and z, find the value for this algebraic expression when you have those assigned values given to you. First, x is 4 plus y, which is 9, plus 2, which is z squared. 4 plus 9 is 13 plus 4. The value of this expression here is 17 when you have these specific numbers assigned as values of the variable. All right, example number three. We have some subtraction in here and see what happens when we do that. We're going to evaluate 3a squared minus b plus c cubed when a is 1, b has a value of 4, and c is equal to 3. We want to substitute in to this original expression these values for the variables. So we're going to have 3 times 1 squared minus 4 plus 3 used as a factor 3 times. 3 times 1 squared is 3 minus 4 plus. 3 times 3 is 9, right? No, that's wrong. This cube, this exponent of 3 up here, what that is telling you is to use 3 as a factor 3 times. 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. Negative 1 plus 27 gives us a value of 26 for this algebraic expression when a is equal to 1, b is equal to 4, and c is equal to 3. All right, we now have example 4, which has some fractions in here. And you think, oh, no, it's fractions. It's going to be so really, really hard. You use fractions just the same way that you substitute anything else. And they're asking us to evaluate the expression x squared times y times z squared. And they're giving us values where x is equal to a negative 1 half, y has a value of a negative 2, and z is equal to 1 fourth. Once again, when you substitute these values in for the variables, make sure you enclose them in parentheses. It makes it easier for you to keep track of what we're doing. We have x squared, so that's going to be a negative 1 half in parentheses squared. x squared, y, z squared, that means we're multiplying these values together. If you need to put a little raised dot in there to indicate multiplication, you can do it, but just having the parentheses bumped up against one another indicates multiplication. Negative one-half quantity squared times a negative two times z squared. So we're going to substitute in one-fourth in parentheses for that z, and we have one-fourth squared. Negative one-half squared is going to give us, interesting, I'm looking ahead and thinking if, wondering if I did something wrong. Okay, I didn't. Thinking of two different problems. Negative one-half quantity squared, that means take negative one-half times a negative one-half. And that's going to give you a positive one-fourth. If you don't see how that can be, let me write it out here for you. Negative one-half times negative one-half. Negative times a negative is always positive. When you're multiplying fractions, you multiply the numerators together, you multiply the denominators together, and that's how we ended up with one-fourth. So we have one-fourth times a negative two times one-sixteenth. Okay? Now, let's see what we end up with. I want to make sure that I don't put a skip step in here that they do not have. Okay. Do you realize that all three of these can be written as rational numbers? 
Remember, a rational number is something that looks like a fraction. We have this negative 2 here. If you write that as an expression over 1, all of a sudden, it's just screaming obvious to you that you have three fractions here. What you're going to want to do is recognize that you have common factors that you can cancel. You can either cancel the 2 with the 16 or the 2 with the 4. I'm going to cancel this way. Say that I have left a negative 1 and I have a value of 2. And I'm still not being real happy. Okay. I happen to think my way of doing it is a little bit more straightforward than the book. The book just multiplies numerators, multiplies denominators together before they cancel. And I find that very interesting because they have been teaching you that it makes more sense to cancel common factors first. So let me continue with this problem. I now have a negative 1 in the numerator. And then I have 2 times 1 times 16. So that gives me a value of negative 1 32nd. Everybody see that? It should be pretty obvious to you. Now let me take this opportunity here to write in black ink on the right how they chose not to cancel common factors first. Does it matter which way you go? Absolutely not. It's whichever makes the most sense to you. Both are equally legitimate methods. So I'm going to pick right up here at this step, and I have 1 fourth times a negative 2 times 1 16th. Multiply numerators together. 1 times negative 2 times 1 is negative 2 over 4 times 16 is 64. So now you have to reduce with the larger number. You have a factor of 2 in common. When you cancel out that factor of 2, you end up with negative 1 over 32. Makes no difference which approach you take. You can cancel common factors before you multiply. You can multiply numerators and denominators out first and then cancel after you have arrived at that product. But that's what they did. That's the difference in the book. They have in your book here a definition of substitution. It says, substitution is the process of replacing a variable with a value or an algebraic expression. What's important, let me see who's out there. What's important about substitution is that you realize that they're going to give you a number that you plug in for each one of these letters. And you're going to want to be careful to enclose that number in parentheses. It makes your work a lot easier for you. Now, evaluating expressions. How do you evaluate an expression? That's what we've been doing. It says substitute the given values for the variables, number one. Evaluate by following the order of operations. We've been doing this process for quite a long time, both in Algebra 1 and in Pre-Algebra. So that's pretty much the end of what they're teaching us in Section 3.4. They have a few extra problems here in my teacher guide. I think I'll go ahead and select just one more for you. As an illustration, let me pick one that's a little bit different. None of them are particularly hard. In fact, they're pretty easy. I'll pick this one right here. It has fractions. You don't have a number 9, but I do. And that is a squared plus b squared plus c. We have a value for a of 1 fourth. b is equal to 1 half. And C is equal to 3 fourths, which is an interesting pattern. They're counting by fourths over here. Now we want to go in and substitute in for those values. We have 1 fourth squared plus 1 half squared plus 3 fourths. 1 fourth times 1 fourth is 1 sixteenth. It is not 
1a. When you're multiplying fractions together or squaring fractions, numerators are multiplied together, denominators are multiplied together. Another way to think of this, which then I'll get back to pointing out to you, is that you can square the numerator and the denominator separately. When you have the square of this parentheses here, square the numerator gives you 1, square the denominator gives you 16. This is a different approach. You can think of it either this way or using 1 fourth as a factor twice. There will be times when it will be to your advantage to think about squaring the numerator and squaring the denominator. So back to what we're talking about here. 1 16th plus 1 4th plus 3 fourths. Now, what we can do here is just rewrite all of these with the con common denominator, which of course is going to be 16th. I immediately see that our answer is going to be 17 16 because 1 4th plus 3 4th is equal to 1. But let's go ahead and rewrite these with a common denominator. We have 1 16 plus, what are we going to have to multiply our second and our third fraction by to arrive with a denominator of 16? Yeah, we're going to multiply by 4 over 4. So we have 4 16 plus 12. Sixteenths. We now have a common denominator and we arrive at our numerator by adding the separate numerators together. 1 plus 4 is 5 plus 12 is 17. So, work on those. Do your best. Send me a text if you need help or we can go ahead and talk about these more when we're in class on Friday.